Okay. Hello. Sorry about that. Uh, so I guess one last time I'll say where we are in the book. Yeah. Right. Um, so, I mean, actually not reading all the way to the end of the Doctrine of Elements, but uh, we're, we're at the end of it, right? So, uh, Okay, we, so we finished the transcendental analytic, the transcendental dialectic, concepts of pure reason, the inferences, the dialectical inferences of pure reason. And there's three dialectical inferences of pure reason, the paralogisms, the antinomies, and the ideal. And um, the reading for this week was, so at least uh, the way I was trying to explain it, although I'm not 100% sure about this, to tell you the truth, right? But the way I was trying to explain it, the actual dialectical inference was, in, was being discussed in the reading from last week. That is the one that's proper to this place. This, this reading discusses a lot of dialectical inferences or bad inferences, according to Kant, right? But the... But the one that actually like matches up to these two, I, I'm claiming, was already discussed in the reading for last time. So, um, but then in this reading, Kant goes on to discuss what I take to be a further issue, right? Which is like, okay. Given that we have this concept of the ideal, which already involves some kind of mistake, um, why do we go on and uh, conclude that um, there must that an object corresponding to the ideal must actually exist? Um, so, uh, like in a general way, um, Kant already described that even in the previous reading. Um, so this is on B six sixteen, and it's page four ninety eight. Kemp Smith. Um, I guess I meant to read this part, even though I quoted it wrongly. Okay. For um For if we take the issue as being that which is here stated, namely first, that from any given existence, it may be merely my own existence we can correctly infer the existence of an unconditional and necessary being. And secondly, that we must regard a being which contains all reality and therefore every condition as being absolutely unconditioned. And in this concept of an ens realissimum, we have therefore found the concept of a thing to which we can also ascribe absolute necessity, granting all this. All right, so, I mean, sorry, so he's just gonna say in granting all this, it still doesn't follow, blah, blah, blah. But that's the, that's the basic argument that, right? I mean, that's how Kant thinks we get 
from the ideal to a proof of the existence of the, that is an object of the ideal. Um, and so it involves um, another dialectical inference from somewhere else. Um, um, namely, I think it's from the fourth antinomy. So the, right, the thesis of the fourth antinomy was, and this wasn't part of the assigned reading, but it's on B480 and it's on page 415. This is the thesis of the fourth antinomy. There belongs to the world either as its part or as its cause a being that is absolutely necessary. Right, so from as as Kant keeps saying, like from another quarter, from somewhere else, comes the conclusion that there is an absolutely necessary being. Um, absolutely necessary being. Now, it doesn't tell us anything else about that <laughs> right it just says there has to be an absolutely necessary being but um Kant says like what happens is we look around for a concept that's that's suitable to represent an absolutely necessary being and we say aha the idea <laughs> um and therefore we take this as a proof of the existence of the idea of this, of the object of this idea. Um, however, Kant, so it's like, that's what, I mean, That's how Kant thinks that the whole question of the existence of this object even comes up here. Right? He says, like, for the, the purpose that reason wanted this ideal for, namely to have a sum of all possibilities compared to which every other possibility is derived. Um, like, what you really need here is not absolute necessity, but just absolute possibility. Right, that it's it's just you need to say that that uh, this thing is possible unconditionally, and everything else is possible because it's possible. Um, so the so exist the question of existence only comes up here because of this. Now, I mean, um. I guess you should, I mean, that's not the only reason the question of the existence of God comes up, according to Kant, right? There's other reasons the question of the existence of God comes up. Um, but in in those contexts, at least to begin with, it's not the ideal that we're talking about. I mean, like Kant does think that somehow this transcendental concept of God can get used by the practical philosophy or whatever. Um, but that it's what's directly proved in the nat in the practical philosophy is not um, a being with these transcendental attributes. Um, so like this, it's from, from a theoretical point of view, the question of whether this exists comes up because of the fourth antinomy. Um, and uh, furthermore, Kant is going to say, so, I mean, we know he already thinks there's a mistake here and a mistake here, but he thinks there's a further mistake, <laughs> right? That is, in, in other words, even if this were a perfectly legitimate concept and this were a perfectly legitimate argument, the further step where we identify the thing we're looking for here with the concept we have here is also is also illegitimate. That's so like that's basically what the this section, the impossibility of the proofs. Um, so 
that is the impossibility of any proof of the existence of God this way, this way, or this way, and those are the only ways. Again, those are the only ways from a theoretical point of view. Um, um, right, and when we say there's a proof from a practical point of view, you know, obviously that's going to be really different kind of proof. It, I mean, it means like the, the proof basically is along the lines of I'm required to seek certain ends and that's absolutely necessary, morally necessary, right? Not metaphysically necessary. It's absolutely necessary for me to seek those ends. And then the claim is that it, it, that it would be impossible to seek those ends if, if there weren't uh, an, an executive of the law of morality, basically. Um, so from a practical point of view, it's, uh, absolutely necessary that there is such a being, but from a theoretical point of view, we can't say anything about it. <laughs> That's Kant's conclusion. Um, and he thinks, he thinks that's good. And he even thinks it's a kind of interpretation of traditional Christian doctrine. Right, because it it means that this is not that like the existence of God is not a matter for reason; it's a matter for faith, as as Kant understands faith. <laughs> All right. So anyway, I mean that's just a little note about what happens in the practical philosophy. But so, um, but here he's talking about proofs that he thinks not alone work. Um, and I, I guess I should say one more thing about this before, well, maybe a couple more things before I start discussing the actual proofs is that, I mean, there, so there's, there's three possible, I mean, three impossible proofs, I guess, but anyway, uh, three seemingly possible proofs, ontological proof, cosmological proof. I mean, physico theological um, so like the one what the the overall outline I just gave here is basically a version of the cosmological proof um, um Whereas the ontological proof um, is the proof, uh, and um, I guess I should say also that this corresponds to Descartes' proof of the existence of God in the third meditation. The ontological proof is some kind of proof that God exists by definition. <laughs> um, and it's this is a version <coughs> of Descartes' proof in the fifth meditation, right? There's two different places in the meditations where Descartes proves the existence of God. The third meditation or the fifth meditation. So, um, um, this proof, Kant says, like is natural to human reason, even though it's wrong. It's um, uh, and so by the way, I'm not going to be talking about this proof that I didn't assign out for the reading. Um, this is basically a proof from this is a proof from like argument from design, right? So, um, uh, whereas this proof just starts something exists, for example, I exist, <laughs> and then concludes to the existence of God. This proof starts with saying uh, uh, there's something particular about what exists that couldn't be accounted for if it weren't for uh, uh, if it didn't have a free and intelligent cause. So um, but so so Kant says this is a natural proof. Kant says this is unnatural. Um, it's hard to get people to swallow it. It doesn't appeal to uh, ordinary common sense, to healthy human common sense or whatever. 
And it also, um, you know, doesn't stand up to the close philosophical scrutiny. Um, and so, uh, nevertheless, this is the story he tells. He says, this group secretly relies on this group. <laughs> so, so, like, the... Uh, The history, according to him, is something like this, like this, you know, this natural proof is like turns out to be insufficient when you think about it. I mean, and the step that, that turns out to, to be insufficient is where, again, where you say, oh, and this absolutely necessary being that we prove the existence of here is the same as the being we're talking about here. Um, there is a, right, like, uh, well, so in reality, we don't know what would make something absolutely necessary. <laughs> um, uh, we, we only, we can only use our category of necessity for relative necessity. That's the only way we know how to do that. So, um, uh, so really, when we say, oh, we should start looking for an absolutely necessary being, um, what is it? We, like, we have nothing to go on. <laughs> um, and, so, um, so we start to feel uncomfortable about making this transition. Yeah, this is a kind of thing that I guess, like, because it appears to be something absolutely possible, um, it's not something that something else could be necessary for. I think is is basically the thought here. Um, so it it could be an absolutely necessary being. If it existed, it would be. But that doesn't really tell you that um, this right here is the is 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 the concept of whatever absolutely necessary being we proved here. Yeah. Um, yeah. No other objects can be seen through us. So it's essentially envisioned nowhere but in the context of the possible experience. Nothing is an object for us, and that's a presupposition that some total of all empirical reality is the condition of possibility. And then the only thing that's a little reason is that the principle of 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 the That pretty much seems to put it the empirical, the sum total of all empirical reality is a condition of possibility. Is that the same as like that's what we mistakenly think must be absolute necessity or an entity? Well, um, Like he's saying there is some valid principle here. Yeah, a pre presupposition of the sum total of all empirical reality, the sum totality of existence. Right. So um so the 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 correct conclusion is that uh um at least this is what i think it's like this this is hard to understand what's going on here but i think that part about the 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 sum of all empirical reality as the condition of possibility for any object that's correct 
Um, now, of course, we're not given the sum of all empirical reality as an object either, right? I mean, that's the illusion of the antinomies. Um, but, you know, so uh, what that means is, like, no matter how much of experience we take, it's always conditioned. <laughs> but it's conditioned on the rest of experience. That's the valid principle, right? So, so the first thing that happens after that, now owing to a natural illusion, we regard this principle, which applies only to those things which are given as objects of our senses, as being a principle which must be valid of things in general. And so it means both it's true of, we, we think it's true of anything, whether it's an object of our senses or not, but we also think that the sum total that it's conditioned by must be the sum of all, all possibility, right? That's, that's the ideal. So, um, and yeah, that's the thing that we start identifying with the absolutely necessary being. Um, I, uh, one thing that's confusing here though is uh, why only, only one side of the antinomy gets involved in this, right? Like what about the antithesis? I mean, I guess the antithesis doesn't. Well, I mean, first of all, this is the one we favor. And I mean, it's it's kind of weird to say that in the, I mean, or it might, it sounds kind of weird to say that in the context of the first critique, but I mean, but he's thinking ahead to the, to the side that, that, so to speak, is true from the point of view of morality. Right. That's so. That's the one that's good. <laughs> um, you know. Um, so this is the one we favor, and that's you know that even though it's really on no better ground than the antithesis, um, that's why we, if we were impartial judges, we wouldn't get into this trouble. Um, but another question is why, like the thesis of the fourth antinomy says that this being is either part of the world or its cause. It seems that we've left out the part of the world possibility here. Um, So well, I don't know. There's uh, there's there's some complications there that I might not understand. <laughs> but yeah. So basically, this but so this but the sum of empirical reality, we don't um, we don't have any tendency to think as uh, suitable to be a necessary being. I think you know that I'm worrying a little bit about why that why that is, but. <laughs> Um, but the sum of all possible reality we do we do have a tendency to think of as as a necessary as as being a suitable representation of a necessary being. Right. So anyway, so the history is that we we basically, I mean, Kant says that actually this is the oldest group. We start with this. But in, in, and then there's another there's a further story that this one secretly relies on this one. <laughs> But um, but just to begin with this one, Kant says, you know, uh, we start with this, but then we notice that there's this insufficiency in it. Um, and so we surreptitiously smuggle in the ontological argument, right? Because um, um, if the object of this idea exists by definition, that is, exists necessarily, then it's an absolutely necessary being. Right. So uh, so then these two I these two concepts are the same. Um, and Kant says that that like at first what happens is that if you that if you gave people the, the ontological proof straight out, they would say, well, that, that doesn't make sense. But um, um, but uh, but without noticing it. They identify these two concepts. And hopefully, if there's time at the end, I'll say a, a little bit more about exactly how that happens. 
But anyway, like, because um, I think it's not simple. And even there's like two different ways of explaining how it happens. <laughs> um, but uh, um, so, and then after a while, after people have gotten used to weird, unnatural scholastic arguments, someone, namely Anselmo Canterbury, right, says, oh, wait, we can just take this part out. <laughs> and at that point, people are ready to hear it, right? Although the truth is um, that uh, the majority of medieval uh, philosophers didn't think the ontological case was a good case, right? It was basically revived by Descartes. Right? Like Thomas Aquinas is, comes out against it, for example. Um, but, uh, right, and so Kant says, I always think this is such a funny image that, um, that like, we think, and I think he's, he's thinking, well, about Descartes, yeah, I guess about Descartes, and even more about Leibniz. He says, we think we have these two independent witnesses to the existence of God, because these are completely different proofs. Right, like this one is pure a priori, just from examining the concept, whereas this one begins with the fact that something exists. So we think we have these two independent witnesses, but he says it's actually this the same witness who went out and like put on a disguise and came back in. <laughs> so, um, okay, so what is the ontological proof? That's I'm going to start by discussing that. And then hopefully discuss that. Um, unless are there more questions before I go on? So it's actually, I mean, um. This is how it goes in the fifth meditation. This is a like an old trans the translation by John Vetch or Vetch, how that's pronounced. But um, anyway, uh, so in the fifth meditation, oh, I shouldn't have probably heard this. In the fifth meditation, Descartes, uh, I think the main point of the fifth meditation is to um, uh, reestablish the um, reliability of mathematics, right? Like in the first meditation, the meditator first cast doubts on the senses and then says, oh, but mathematics is still true. But then there's a reason for doubting that. And right, so the, so the fifth meditation is supposed to reestablish mathematics and then the sixth meditation reestablishes partly belief in the senses, right? So at least in the sensible world. So, um, so, so the beginning of the fifth meditation, Descartes has done that. And then he says, but now if, because I can draw, well, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, um, may I not derive from this, derive an argument for the existence of God. And here's the argument. And at, after the argument, he says, and therefore, even if everything else I said before was wrong, at least the existence of God is, is at least as certain as the result of mathematical proofs, right? So in other words, Descartes actually seems to think that the, fifth the third meditation proof is better than the fifth meditation proof. The third meditation proof is absolutely certain and rests directly on the cogito argument. The fifth meditation proof is good assuming we can rely on demonstrations like this, right? So, but anyway, here's the demonstration. It is certain that I find that I no less find the idea of a God in my consciousness, that is the idea of a being supremely perfect than that of any figure or number, whatever. And I know with not less clearness and distinctness that an eternal existence pertains to his nature than that all which is demonstrable of any figure or number really belongs to the nature of that figure or number. And that's the whole argument, <laughs> right? So, right, so that is, the idea is, I mean, the, the steps are first, like, the 
have an idea of an infinitely perfect being. Um, Descartes has actually proved that in the third meditation. <laughs> um, so, uh, but you know, but this 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 idea of the infinite, at least Kant is identifying with what he calls the ideal, the transcendental ideal, right? It's the idea of an infinitely perfect being, a being that has all reality. Um, and then, uh, you know, but I know certainly that eternal existence belongs to that being. And this is supposed to be parallel to, you know, have an idea of a triangle. And I know certainly that you know, having three angles belongs to the idea of the triangle. I should say belongs to that. I guess I should say belongs to that idea. And over here, the conclusion is, therefore, a triangle has three angles. Right? So, you know, because I can rely on whatever I clearly and distinctly know, uh, I have this clear and distinct idea of a triangle. I clearly and distinctly perceive that having three angles belongs to that idea. Therefore, a triangle has three angles. <laughs> um, and the parallel over here is supposed to be, therefore, an infinitely perfect being exists. Right, because eternal existence is plays the same role in on this side as having three angles plays on this side. And so here the conclusion is a triangle has three angles. Here the conclusion is an infinitely perfect being exists. Therefore, God exists. <laughs> um, um, by the way, uh, like the, the, the next thing Descartes says is, um like um and here this translation is not very right wait let's see yeah like however uh at you know at first glance this is not completely clear um and uh seems to involve some species of sophism, <laughs> right? So um, that is, I think Descartes in saying that is acknowledging what Kant says about this argument, that it isn't natural, right? That this is a, even after you see this parallel, you're like, what? <laughs> you got something for nothing there. How could that be? <laughs> Um, so Descartes is aware of that. He just he, but he thinks that that that's that that that's going to be your first impression, but that it's a mistake. That this argument is really good. Um, Descartes, uh, Kant thinks, yeah, you should have trusted your instinct. This argument is bad, right? So, um, um, And then there's kind of one thing that Leibniz adds to his version of this, which is, um, which is included in the version Kant is thinking of. Um, because Leibniz says, um, 
mean, maybe Descartes doesn't think this can come up because it's clear and distinct. I don't know. But anyway, Leibniz says, you know, I understand the definition, an infinitely perfect being. Yeah, I mean, the truth is, when I think about it, that's not really fair to Descartes. He doesn't just say, you understand the definition, right? He says at the end of the third meditation, like, but I could never understand myself as finite if I didn't have the idea of an infinite perfection. Right, so, but anyway, the way, the, the way Leibniz approaches it is he says, you know, okay, uh, this, this is basically saying that God exists by definition, again, just as a triangle by definition has three angles. So uh, Leibniz says, but hold on a second. How do we know that this definition is self-consistent, right? So like he gives examples of things that look like good definitions. Like his example is the highest speed, which is a funny example because actually, I guess, we think there is a highest speed, <laughs> at least the highest speed that something can go, so to speak. Um, but anyway, um, right, so that's his example, right? Like that looks like a good, if you said you could say something like the largest integer, right? I mean, there's no obvious contradiction in the words, but there is a contradiction and there couldn't be a largest integer. Right, so like if you tried to carry out a proof like this, starting with the largest integer, you know, right? And so you said like the largest integer is larger than every other integer. <laughs> uh, like that's what you're trying to prove. You wouldn't really have proved it because the definition you started with was no good. So Leibniz says we have to, there has to be a further step where I show that this definition is coherent. But he says, um, and uh, um, we saw the version of this in the Kant's version of this in the ideal. Leibniz says, but how could there be any contradiction in the concept of an infinitely perfect being because it contains all positives and no negatives? Right, and again, that's something that Kant discusses the amphiboly and says that, that that's not right. It's empirical predicates can, real predicates can cancel each other out. Um, but so in any case, um, that's the ontological proof. Um, where does Kant think the mistake is? So the first thing he says about this, I think is not aimed at the proof as we actually, as it's actually made. Um, this is B622 on page 502. Um, um, By the simple, oh, here we go. Um, by the simple device of forming an a priori concept of a thing in such a manner as to include existence within the scope of its meaning, we have supposed ourselves to have justified the conclusion that because existence necessarily belongs to the object of the concept, we are also of necessity in accordance with the law of identity required to posit the existence of its object. Hmm. I'm just thinking about this. Maybe I'm not understanding what he's saying right here. But let me say what I was going to say. So, Ray, he's 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 talking as if the argument were, um, well, like um, let me define X as. Uh, something and it exists. And then I prove that X exists. And this obviously could be used to prove that anything you want to exists, right? Like in other words, if I want to prove that a unicorn exists, I can define a boonicorn as a unicorn that exists, 
<laughs> right? And then a unicorn exists because it's defined as a unicorn that exists, right? So like, obviously no one has ever made that argument <laughs> because um, uh, it's uh, like, even without being able to see exactly what's wrong with that, the conclusion is clearly not true, right? So, um, um, but I mean, so so what I think is that Kant like discusses that first because he just wants to show in advance that the um, absurdity of the conclusion that something necessarily exists by virtue of its concept alone. Um, that is the, the absurdity of the thought that the non-existence of something would involve a contradiction. Um, and like he's so he's able to explain pretty easily why this arg this general argument doesn't work. The thing that made me wonder whether maybe I'm misunderstanding him is that he actually says, by the simple device of forming an a priori concept of a thing. I mean, like maybe, maybe the person he's imagining making this argument will say, uh, of course, most concepts you have to acquire from experience. So for example, the concept of a unicorn you would have to acquire from experience. And therefore, sure enough, it would have to exist, right? Like every concept you legitimately require from experience is the concept of something that exists. But here the argument is, no, there's a concept, there's a pure a priori concept that is a, con and a concept that we know a priori is objectively valid. Uh, as a possible object, and then we but we find that it includes existence. So in that case, maybe this this is just supposed to be a general form of the actual argument. I'm not sure, but in any case, what what he says what he says generally speaking goes wrong with this is. Um, remember that every judgment expresses a rule that holds on a certain condition. Nice. I seem to be frozen. I wonder how long that was happening. Now I'm back. Trista, were, was I gone? No, you were good. Oh, okay. Was I frozen though? No, I feel like I was hearing you. Oh, oh, but you weren't. But you're you're not watching the video. No, I'm I'm watching. But yeah, I feel like it was it was yeah it was fine on oh, my okay. part. All right, maybe I was just frozen on my end. All right. Um, um, right, so remember that every judgment expresses a, a rule, says that a rule holds on a certain condition. So, you know, and to get a contradiction, you have to, um, the rule has to be such that if that rule applied, the condition couldn't be satisfied, <laughs> right? That's what a contradiction is. Um, so like if you say um, some triangle doesn't have three angles, um, then uh, the condition is, um, 
struggle with how to understand this in the case of an existential judgment. But 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 the condition is um, is some indeterminate part of the extension of the concept triangle is the condition, right? We're saying some triangle doesn't have three angles. Um, so uh, um, the the rule is not having three angles, but the the condition of being some part of the extension of the concept triangle. Um, is such that this rule of not having three angles couldn't apply, or, or that that this condition couldn't hold at any any time this rule applied, and therefore that judgment is a contradiction. Um, and it's and the the truth of its opposite: all triangles have three angles follows from the principle of contradiction, and it's analytic, right? So. Um, So this is what Kant is talking about in the uh, right after the passage I was reading. If in an identical proposition, I reject the predicate while retaining the subject, contradiction results. And I therefore say that the former belongs necessarily to the latter. But if we reject subject and predicate alike, there is no contradiction for nothing that is then left to be contradicted. Right, so now, right, now the idea is that we're gonna get a contradiction by denying that an infinitely perfect being exists. But by denying that it exists, we deny that we're talking about anything. <laughs> so, um, so we, um, I guess maybe I, I, I should have started with the positive one that's true, right? I get the contradiction by denying the analytic judgment. All triangles have three angles. I try to get rid of the rule, but by saying some triangles don't have three angles, but in doing so, I go against the condition on which I'm asserting the rule, and that's the contradiction. But if I say um, there are no triangles, then I'm getting rid of the condition. <laughs> um, and therefore, there can't be a contradiction. There's nothing left to contradict. And similarly, if I say an infinitely perfect being doesn't exist, uh, it can't, there can't be a contradiction because there's nothing, there's no condition left that could uh, rule up, that could uh, prevent the rule from applying. Um, yeah. What about dimension? Yeah. Are you saying that? But it still only has. It still has three angles. So it's no longer a fixed. In the extended space, in the extension, it's no longer just a triangle. Well, so first of all, when I said the extension of the concept triangle, I meant the logical extension, right? Like there's all the possible triangles, um, not spatial extension. Um, although Kant does think there's a relationship between those two. And even though there, it's not the same word in German, but it is the same word in Latin. And as I always keep saying, Kant is still thinking in Latin. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. But no, I mean, a triangle, when you look at a triangle in three-dimensional space, um, I mean, I guess by a triangle, we usually mean a plane triangle. Right, and there's also spherical triangles and whatever, but they all have three angles. That's what triangle, right? I mean, that's literally what the word means. So it says three angles. <laughs> yeah.
Well, I think, you know, the thing is, we haven't explained what's really going on in a in a judgment of existence like this. Right? Something exists. That is, we haven't really explained how exists can be a predicate. Um, so, um, so yes, this picture is mysterious. It's, this judgment is supposed to be an infinitely perfect being exists. I mean, this is, if, if the condition is that something is an infinitely perfect being, and then the rule is that it must exist, that like it's unclear what kind of rule this is but i'm get, kant is going to say something and i'm going to say more about it in a second right but i think what kant is pointing out though is that forgetting what this predicate is or what how this judgment works um when you when you deny that anything meets the condition of a judgment right which in a categorical judgment like an infinitely perfect being exists, the condition is the subject concept, right? So if you deny that anything meets the condition, that is, you say that the, the object of the subject concept doesn't exist, whatever is up here, you can't have a contradiction, right? Like, um, because again, the contradiction requires that um, um, something meets the condition and that makes it impossible for the rule to apply. That's, that's where the contradiction comes from. But if nothing meets the condition, um, then like, like, again, you're not talking about it. <laughs> yeah. So the condition to mention to the rule of construction of all forces, it seems pretty extreme. So, well, again, so, I mean, we're gonna, existence is, is one of the, existence or actuality is one of the moments of the category of modality. And the category of modality is a weird category. So the predicates and judgments where the sub where the, the, the predicate is a predicate of modality. The, the sorry, judgments where the predicate is a, is a predicate of modality are going to be weird judgments. And that's what we have to talk about. But um, but but Kant is trying to say in advance, I mean, like. I mean, go back to the Boonicorn example. <laughs> That's easier, maybe it's easier to see it there, right? Like if I say uh, um, a Boonicorn doesn't have a horn, I mean, I don't know, I guess if there really are unicorns, you could cut off its horns or something, but you know what I mean, right? Like, well, I mean, the truth is you don't, you don't really, I mean, this has something to do with why concepts empirical concepts don't really have definitions, right? Like what is the what is it what exactly does it take for something to count as a unicorn? But anyway, like just suppose that a unicorn by definition has a horn, right? So if I say you know some unicorn has no horn, there's a contradiction, right? Because I'm saying like something meets this condition, but the rule doesn't apply, and that's the contradiction. Um, because again, like this condition. Um, it's not identical to the rule, but it, it, it involves the rule, it includes the rule, right? So, um, um, but if I say uh, a unicorn doesn't exist, there's no contradiction because I'm not saying something meets the condition of being a unicorn, but it doesn't exist. I'm saying nothing meets the condition of being a unicorn. So whatever I'm saying about it, I can't get into a contradiction. That that's that's the first point Kant is making. Um, yeah. Uh, clarify how Kant 
when you see a pyramid. A pyramid. <laughs> yeah. Back to this. All right. Yeah. But a pyramid is not a triangle. A pyramid is a pyramid. Right. Well, and no, it has that that a I mean, yes, it's not a triangle, but from a distance, you would see a triangle. Well, there is a triangle. Like, right. I mean, you know, there's a triangle here, for example. So would that be a contradiction? Because it's not the triangle. Why not? There's I mean, if there's a unicorn and someone's riding it, so the unicorn has a horn, but this person doesn't have a horn. But that's not a contradiction, right? I mean, this 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 triangle is part of the pyramid, but it's not the whole pyramid. It's like a face. Um, Is that to fit it within uh, the surface group? So it's closer to the surface? Uh, well, that's kind of what I was leading to. It seems like that would that would show contradiction. Well, I mean, uh, th no. It, well, it sounds like you're saying that. Um, so you're just saying that there's two people standing far away from a pyramid and looking at it, but you see just the one side, and you're gonna apply triangle to it. Well, okay, but to, that's to get there to. That's like if the person is riding on a unicorn, you know, behind a hedge, and you see them riding by, and you say, "Oh, that doesn't have a horn because you can't see the horn." That's, I mean, that's not. That doesn't mean that a unicorn that doesn't have a horn. It just means you didn't see it. <laughs> I don't. I mean, it's surprising because, of course, the, like Descartes counts on you saying on, on you thinking that this argument obviously works. This is the argument you're questioning, right? You're saying like, well, maybe a triangle doesn't always have three angles, but I mean, it's. Uh, uh, I mean, a triangle does have a definition according to Kant and according to everything. The definition is that it's a plane figure with three angles. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Maybe you, you can think of a better example. I mean, I, you know, I sometimes think the thing about they're not about a round square is not really a direct contradiction, depending on how you define round and how you define square. Um, or anyway, like a square that's a circle or something like that. A square that's a circle is not a direct contradiction. It depends on some of the properties of, of continuous Euclidean space that squares and circles are designed to produce. I don't know, but anyway, but but I don't think you could do anything like that here. I mean, I mean, there could be a geometry where there are no triangles or something like that, right? But not where triangles don't have three angles. Anyway, um, yeah. So let's let's at least assume for now that this argument is okay. Uh, we want to know why this one doesn't work according to Kant. Um, so. Um, Right, so like what I just said is why Kant says, oh, look, this, you know, this couldn't work. There's no way you could, um, that the non, -ex asserting the non-existence of something could ever involve you in a contradiction. But then he says, um, uh, but the people who make the argument are going to come back against me and say, um, 
But look, we really do have this one concept that includes being in it. <laughs> um, that is the case of an ens realissimum. And I mean, I think it's at this point that Kant says, like, this argument should be enough. <laughs> Right, like you should realize that well, you know this can't be right, but um, but but he's gonna um, explain a different way or in more detail or um, he's gonna explain. I guess he's gonna explain why, like it seems to you that it works, <laughs> and and um, what the mistake is. So I mean. So here we were just talking about, in general, some concept that's supposed to include existence. And I mean, I don't know if unicorn was supposed to be a good example or not, but uh, but in any case, it's just some concept that's supposed to include existence. And Kant is in in, in effect showing that that you know you couldn't have a concept like that, right? So um, I mean, it's exactly parallel to and probably based on Hume's proof that, um, well, no, maybe I should say that here. I mean, I'll say that. Right, so, but now he takes on the, the like, right, that it, I mean, it seems to show that there couldn't be a concept like that, because if there could be a concept like that, then this judgment that X exists would be analytic and how could the opposite of it not be a contradiction so but since denying the existence of something can't be a contradiction like you already know that existence doesn't belong in concepts but i think yeah that's probably the right way to put it so then but then leibniz and descartes come back and say but look here's a concept that includes existence right and like the reason it's supposed to clearly include existence is because it's infinitely perfect, and uh, and existing is more perfect than not existing, <laughs> or um, actually existing is more perfect than possibly existing, right? Like existing in reality is more perfect than existing only in concept. Um, that's kind of the way it first comes up in Anselm's argument. Um, so, so Kant has to explain um, why it's not true that actual existence is one of the perfections that's included in the idea of an infinitely perfect being. Now, um, you know, so one way he could respond is by saying being is not a predicate at all. It's not um, something, a property that you attribute to something or something like that. Um, and uh, um, so that's actually not what Kant says. <laughs> um, that is an answer that came up, that became popular later, like in the 20th century. Um, and I mean, it's probably not wrong to think that it's somehow in the spirit of what Kant is saying. It was suggested by what Kant says, but you know the way it works out is quite different. So people say, you know, this is the right way to write existence. A fee exists, right? And there's no property of existence here. <laughs> it, is, you know, this quantifier or whatever that is. <laughs> I mean, I say whatever that is because not because who knows what it is, but because like in the history of mathematical logic, there have been, um, although the, the, the math everyone agrees on, like what a quantifier actually is, no one agrees on. <laughs> You know, like Frego thinks one thing, Russell thinks something else, and so on. You know, Klein thinks another thing, and anyway, um, so uh, but but whatever it is, whatever this quantifier it is, it's it's certainly not a property of something, right? Um, but 
so and I guess at some point people thought, among other things, actually Carnap says that this refutes the ontological proof and the cogito argument. <laughs> Because this is the only way of writing existence, and both of those arguments depend on existence being a property or something like that. Right? So, like, um, like you have to be able to say I exist, but you can't translate that into this. So, um, uh, and like Carnap thought it was established by, like it had been discovered by modern logicians that this was the right way to represent existence. Nowadays, there's no consensus on that anymore or anything else about that stuff, right? I mean, people study logic with existence predicates, and whatever, but, um, but uh, never mind. All right. And I mean, it's like a big, like part of, Wine's whole, like one of his fundamental ideas is that you can write A exists like this. <laughs> um, but anyway, never mind that. So, because again, all of that, that that's not what Kant, Kant is saying. What is he saying? Well, so this is on B626 on page 504. Um, being is obviously not a real predicate. That is, it is not the concept of something which could be added to the concept of a thing. So being or existence or actuality Right, I think for for Kant, these are all synonymous, and they all refer to the second moment of the. They, they're they're all terms for the second moment of the category of modality. Um, and he's saying is not a real predicate. And reading again the continuation there, it is not a concept of something which could be added to the concept of a thing, right? It's not real. It's not thingal because <laughs> it doesn't help decide what thing you're talking about. Um, now, okay, I mean, what other kind of predicates are there? So, I mean, Kant, the, the example, Kant says it's not a real predicate, but it's just a logical predicate. But logical predicate turns out to be like any predicate at all, right? And Kant, the example Kant gives of something that's merely a logical predicate is when something is predicated of itself, right? Like Socrates is Socrates. Right, or all, a triangle is a triangle, or something like that. That is a, a tautology in the literal sense, where the subject and the predicate are exactly the same. So he says that's not a real predicate because it doesn't help to determine the concept of the subject. So, I mean, okay, fine, you can see why that's true. It doesn't, because it doesn't add anything to the concept of the subject because it's the same as the concept of the subject. But um, but it's not very helpful because it doesn't seem that being is very much like that. <laughs> um, so um, so we need a better understanding of what kind of predicate it is if it's not a real predicate. So he says on the next page. Um, So this the explanation here is a little bit confusing because it starts with the use of the word is as the copula. Do you know what do you know what copula means? No. 
Right. Okay. So if you have a judgment like this, this is called the Kafka Um It's that seems to be saying. I mean, offhand, you might say that this use of is 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 different from this use of is. <laughs> I mean, we don't usually use the verb to be for this in English at all, right? We would say S exists, but um, S, if you just say S is, it seems like a different use of the verb than this use for the Kafka. Um, but uh, Kant seems to be saying here that they really are somehow the same word. I'm not sure if I understand, but I understand the last part of it anyway, which is, so this is B627 on page 505. Um, if we say God is, or there is a God, that's how we'd really say it in English, right? There is an S. And in German, I'm sure, I, in German you say es gibt, right? It gives uh, something. <laughs> But anyway, if you say God is or there is a God, we attach no new predicate to the concept of God, but only pro posit the subject in itself with all its predicates, and indeed posit it as being an object that stands in relation to my concept. So we did say something. Right? If we say, like... Um, a triangle exists, or there is a triangle. Pot says, um, we didn't add a new predicate to triangle. But what, but what we said was something about the relationship of the object to my concept triangle. Yeah. Just two further questions that just passed by. <laughs> when you said object in this context, what are we talking about? Is it a, something that could potentially exist in intuition? And, or I guess I'm just unclear on what. So, and, um, this is what I've tried to say about the word object all along. And I think it's what that sorry, yeah. Object is a is is a relative word. It's it's the object of some so in this case we're talking about the object of my concept. And when we say, right, so like if I say a triangle has three angles. I'm telling you something about, like, I'm adding to your knowledge of the contents of the concept. Like, maybe you didn't know that before. But if I say a triangle exists, I'm talking about the relationship of my concept to something that is its object. I'm saying it has an actual object. And I haven't added anything to the concept, right? So I haven't told you by telling you a triangle. If you if you if you already knew all the properties of a triangle, you still wouldn't know whether it existed or not. And I could tell you it exists, and then I wouldn't be telling you a new property that goes in this concept. I'd be telling you the relationship of this concept to its object. That. Um... And this goes along with what Kant says about the categories of modality, right? So if you go way back to the postulates of empirical thought in general, um, right, this is B265 on page 239, or no, B266. The categories of modality have the peculiarity that, in determining an object, they do not in the least enlarge the concept to which they are attached as predicates. 
they only express the relation of the concept to the faculty of knowledge. Even when the concept of the thing is quite complete, I can still inquire whether this object is merely possible or is also actual, or if actual, whether it is not also necessary. Right, so it's not just being that's not a real predicate. All the moments of modality are not real predicates. And they're not real predicates because the, you know, with the category of relation, the, like, um, uh, everything that goes into representing a thing is already there. It's quantity, it's quality, and it's relation, right? And so we're done representing the thing. Right? But the, and where does modality come in? It's because we still need to ask, how is the thing related to me? Right? And therefore, the postulates um, farther up on this page, right? So the, the postulates of empirical thought in general are one, that which agrees with the formal conditions of experience is possible. Two, that which is bound up with the material conditions of experience, that is with sensation, is actual. And three, that when it's, which in its connection with the actual is determined in accordance with universal conditions of experience is, that is, exists as necessary. So, um, so if you ask more in, more particularly, what am I telling you when I tell you that my concept has an actual object? Well, you have to supply the schema of the category, right? That is, I mean, if this if this object is not sensible, then I don't know what to do. But if it is sensible, I know what you're telling me, namely that it's somehow connected to sensations that I'm getting that, that I'm getting. Right now, I know I don't have to actually be sensing it now. I don't even have to be able to sense it directly. Right. One of the examples Kant discusses there is the so-called magnetic fluid. Right. So, like, I mean, we don't believe in this anymore. We believe in things like this. Right. So, you know. They thought that the reason that when a magnetic field involves some fluid actually flowing around. <laughs> um, so Kant says, you know, we don't have the proper senses to sense this directly, but it's bound up with our sensations, right? I mean, we can detect it. This is like, one of the, yeah. That like define dark matter. Yeah, dark matter or just even regular old like electrons or whatever, right? Or X rays, right? We can't see X rays, but we know they're there because we can put the photographic plate, make it, you know, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, it is related to verification. Uh, The question is, um, well, there are a couple of things that make this different from classical like verification, which is the NS so called verification. I mean, one is again, Kant denying that empirical concepts have a definition, right? So, uh, like, we can't actually perform a reduction of the kind that the Vienna Circle would want to do, right? And replace all our talk of cinnabar and whatever we talk about sensations. That's number one. And, but number two is, like, Kant thinks, I mean, thinks it's important that sensations are an effect of something on me. Um, so uh, that is, he's not trying to, uh, well, I guess, I mean, it has something to do with the difference between saying being is not a real predicate and saying being is not a predicate at all. <laughs> right, is, you know, 
he, he's not trying to uh, rule out the metaphysical question. But does something actually correspond to this? On the contrary, he thinks he can prove that something does, right? That's a refutation of idealism. So, um, so it's related to verificationism, but it's not exactly the same as what's usually called verificationism, I think is the right answer. Um, okay, so, um, I don't have that much time left. But I have to talk about the one hundred dollars or dollars, um, right? So, um, so he illustrates this point by the example of one hundred dollars. I mean, dollar. This is the same word as dollar, right? Because dollar comes from this. But anyway, so, he, and, and I guess, I mean, he's thinking of them as actual, like, coins, money, you know, metal that's worth something. That might or may not be important. But anyway, so he says that, let's call them $100, right? So here's the concept of $100. Now, if I just have the concept, but, I don't have a hundred dollars. <laughs> um, then it looks like this. But now, suppose I do have a hundred dollars. So now there's something that's in the right relationship to my concept. That is, it's causing sensations that conform to the rule of the concept. Um, what is that? Well, it's you know, it's, I mean, this is the concept of a hundred dollars. This is actually a hundred dollars. <laughs> I guess I mean it is easier to understand if you think of their coin of being coins. I mean, because right now having a hundred dollars in my bank account, what does that mean? <laughs> What's affecting my sensibility? It's it's imaginary, you know. But anyway, never mind that. So like um this is a hundred dollars. Now so Kant says, like, which is more money? The merely possible $100 or the actual $100? They have to be exactly the same amount of money, right? The whole point is that this has to correspond to this if it exists, right? So this can't be like worth $100 in one cent. <laughs> then this wouldn't be the concept of this. And, you know, I mean, money is a good example because it only has this one perfection, one of them. Right, I mean, like, there's no other perfection in this. So he's saying, you know, so like, obviously, it's you know, you can see just from looking at it that um, there's something wrong with thinking that being is a real predicate. And on the other hand, I think Kant, Kant adds, but you can see that it is a predicate, right? Because it makes a big difference to me whether the hundred dollars exists or not. <laughs> so it's something important. <laughs> whether it exists or not, but what it isn't is something that can be added to the concept. Um, now, um, what, what's, let's go back to this, though. An infinitely perfect being. What am I adding to that when I say, so remember, I was claiming that the, con the conclusion of the ideal really is that an infinitely perfect being is absolutely possible. What am I adding to that when I tell you, and it's actually, well, this is not a possible object of experience. So, um, um, I don't know what I'm at. <laughs> and, right, and that's why Kant says this is uh, the 629 on page 506. Um, I'm standing near the camera here. Mm -hmm. 
um, It is not therefore surprising that if we attempt to think existence through the pure category alone, we cannot specify a single mark distinguishing it from mere possibility. That is what makes it hard to refute this argument. If you tried to prove to someone that $100 exists by an argument like this, they would say, well, where is it? <laughs> What makes it hard to refute this argument is precisely that we've gone into a, a realm where there is no difference between possibility and actuality. So in a sense, it's true that if it's possible, it's actual. That is, saying that it's actual is no more than saying that it's possible. It's, and either way, you're not saying anything. <laughs> yes. um, they, I mean, you have to qualify it. Not, not you're not saying anything in the sense that it's nonsense. Right. This again, we have to like. There's a difference between Kant and and Karnak. Um, uh, I mean, for a reason, Karnak thinks that what Kant tried to do didn't work. That like bad metaphysics got back in some. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, that um, it's not nonsense, but it's um, you're saying something in terms of concepts that you have no way of applying. You have no schematism, schema. Right. So that's what's wrong with the ontological proof. I only have five minutes left to discuss the cosmological proof. Um, Yeah, let me just talk a little bit about the way the ontological proof is supposed to be secretly smuggled back in, in disguise. Because <laughs> um, I think Kant says two different things about it. Like one of them is maybe right, but it's not that helpful. So, um, Again, the cosmological proof, according to Kant, the way it works is that uh, we have the concept of an absolutely necessary being. This comes from the fourth antinomy. And on the other hand, over here, we have the idea, which comes from the idea. <laughs> So, um, and the question is how the cosmological proof needs to identify these two with each other. Otherwise, this, this is something we hopefully we'll get to talking about in my next class where I'm talking about the Hume's dialogues concerning natural religion. You know, um, uh, one of the characters says something that Kant also mentions, I mean, that's the wrong word, right? Kant mentioning it because of that character. But anyway, the like um maybe um huh? right. Maybe matter is the absolutely necessary being. How do we know it's not? Right. So in that case, this would be the last thing that the theist wanted to prove. <laughs> Right, so we need to make this connection for the cosmological proof to be a proof of the existence of God. Um, and um, oh boy, I'm really out of time. But, and I have to hurry to get to the next class. I'll, I'll just say like, the first thing he says is that the argument is something like we only have one we we need to look for a concept that is such that we know that its object is an absolutely necessary being we only have one concept that could that could serve in that role and that's the ideal but Kant says hold on a second so if this concept can serve in that role, 
namely that we know just from the concept that it's its object is an absolute absolutely necessary being that's the ontological truth <laughs> right so what if you're saying if what you're saying is right the ontological proof should work um, all right, that's a lot more to say about it, other things he says about it, but I will stop there. And thank you very much for, for coming to this last lecture in person, um, those who are here, and uh, uh, have a good summer. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Oh, and I should say, I will have an office hour tomorrow. If people want to meet me after that, you should let me know. Okay.